Hello and welcome to our first event with Gloucestershire Archives. My name is Gemma and today I'm going to be doing a really exciting event with you which is all about the census, something which will be happening later on this month. Now just before we start, just to go through a couple of uh, important things uh, for you to be aware of. Um, first of all, um, it's better if you could make us into on a full screen by pinning us. Um, you can do that by either double tapping or hovering over our image. Uh, press the box with the three dots and select pin. And what that means is that you'll be able to see all the images and things we're going to be using in this session. Um, if you have any questions as you go along, um, if I could ask you to pop those into the chat box and send them to us. And at the end, we will be um, answering them all together. Thank you. Um, we hope that you will sit here and watch what we're doing, but don't forget that you are very welcome to come and go as you want. Thank you. Um, so welcome to the Passport to the Past, Making Sense of the Census. Um, we're going to ask you to put yourselves on mute for most of today's presentation. Um, but if I could ask you all just at this moment to take off mute. And what we're going to do is we're all just going to say a really big group hello to one another. Um, so if you've taken off mute, on the count of three, one, two, three. Hello. 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 Lovely. It's so nice to see you all. Okay, you wouldn't mind now popping yourselves back on mute and then you don't have to worry about if the dog barks or anything like that. Thank you. Um, so what will you need in this session? Well, if you've had a chance to print off your passport to the past, which was attached to the email that was sent to you with the invite, then if you could have that to one side, that would be brilliant. And on the screen, you can now see some images of some of the activities in the passport to the past that you might want to have a go at. Um, so there are all kinds of things from, um, uh, from word searches, colouring in. There are some particular events that tie in with today's census, which you can have a go at and like I said we really hope that you kind of you, you were involved with us and watching and listening but you know you have this here as well if you want to have a go um, if you're going to use it you'll need a pen or a pencil um, if you have some colored pencils and pens that's great as well um, if you haven't had a chance to print it out please don't worry it's not essential to this session and it will still be there on your invite when the session is finished if you want to have a go and it's also there um, on our website thank you um, so what will we be doing in this session? So first of all, we're going to have two halves in this presentation. So I'm going to be telling you a bit about the census to begin with, finding out what it is, and then we're going to have a look at one and really try and get our eye in and understand it. We're then going to have a very short break, only two, three minutes, but it will give you an opportunity to pop to the loo, to grab a cup of tea, whatever it is um, that you would like a break for. Um, and then we'll come back together for the second half. And then, like I said, at the end, there'll be an opportunity for questions. Thank you. So our aims for today, um, we're going to be finding out about how we find out about the past. We're going to be understanding the census and seeing how we can use them to find out about people in the past, such as, for example, members of your family. We'll be thinking about the importance of the 1939 register, which was a one off census that is of great importance to us today. And finally, we're going to be acknowledging the role that luck or even bad luck can play when we are researching the past. Thank you. So first of all, what is a census? A census is a survey of the population by the people in charge. So it's a bit like a questionnaire that you fill in. It's information gathered about people living in a particular area, such as a town, a country or a county. The information gathered helps the government plan for the future, such as knowing who they can tax. It might also mean that they can find out how many people they need to feed. Or it could be that they think that a war might be on the horizon and they need to know how many young male are available to fight in a battle. Censuses go back thousands and thousands of years. And on the left hand side, you can see an example of one that existed in England almost exactly a thousand years ago. So what is the UK census? So the United Kingdom census. So when we talk about the census today, particularly the one that's going to be happening later this month, we generally mean the official census started by the UK government in 1801. 
and it has taken place every 10 years since then, except in 1941, because World War II was taking place. So it took place in 1801, 1811, 1821, 1831, and so on, all the way up to the current date. And for the first few years, the information gala did not include any personal information. So it's really useful if you want to find out about the country, but it's not very useful if you want to find out about, for example, people in your family history. And to the left, you can actually see at the bottom, you can see an example of one of the older censuses, and that was taken in Cheltenham, and it was in 1891. Now, if you're looking at it and you're thinking, I, I can't read this, it's too small, don't worry about that. We're going to be looking at some other censuses in a bit. And what we'll be doing is we'll be showing you the whole census so you can see what it looks like. And then we'll be blowing up nice and big the sections that we really want to understand. Um, since 1841, the census has asked about personal information about everybody living in every single household. And the purple image that you can see at the top, that is the front page of the 2011 ones. That was the one that was done just 10 years ago. OK, so how did it work? Well, on a specific date, every household would fill it in a form which had been delivered by someone called a numerator. Now, an enumerator is a very fancy word for somebody who went around, they would hand out the forms to each household. They would maybe help them to fill them in because, of course, people in the past couldn't necessarily read or write, so sometimes they needed help. And then the enumerator would then go back to each house a few days later and they would collect them. And on the left hand side, you can see a photograph of an enumerator collecting information from a traveller family. So you can just see the edge of the caravan that they're living in. And this is a very good point to mention that not everybody, of course, lives in a traditional house or a flat. And so they would want to collect information from other types of households. And that would include things like prisons, orphanages, hospitals, if you're in the Royal Navy, you might be living on a ship. So perhaps you would need to have a census filled out then as well. So it's not just traditional houses and flats that you've got this kind of information from. So it can be really interesting. And each census since 1841 has been slightly different, but usually asks for the names, the relationships, the address, the age, the marital status, so whether they're married or not, and the job of everyone living in the house, flat or home in the United Kingdom. And the next census, as I said, will take place on the 21st of March 2021, and that will be taking place on a Sunday. And it always happens on a Sunday to catch as many people in as possible. And I think that this year they're going to have the highest rate of filling in these forms because, of course, we're all under lockdown, so we can't go anywhere. And the census is extremely important when trying to find out about people in the past. So what we're going to do now is have a look at an example of one of the very first censuses. And the census you see to the left is from 1841. So that's the first time that you got personal information on these forms. Now, again, if you're looking at that census at the moment and thinking this is too small for me to read, don't worry, because on the next slide, we're going to blow up some of it really nice and big so you can have a proper look. If you look at the top, you will notice the fact that it was taken for Buckingham Palace. Now, can anyone tell me who lives in Buckingham Palace? If you're thinking the Queen, you're absolutely right. Now, can you tell me which queen it was in 1841? I'll just give you a moment to have a think about that. Now, if you thought our queen today, Queen Elizabeth II, that's a really good guess. Um, she is quite an elderly lady, but she wasn't around in 1841. If you said Queen Victoria, you are absolutely spot on. And you can see a picture of Queen Victoria with her husband, Prince Albert, on the screen in front of you now. And you can also see a photograph of Queen Victoria with her first daughter. She had nine children altogether and her first daughter was named after her. So she was called Victoria as well. And if you look at the census and you look down the left hand side where it says names, you will notice it says the Queen, 
it then says His Royal Highness Prince Albert and then the Princess Royal. And the Princess Royal is the title for her daughter, uh, Victoria. So what can we learn? Well, you can now see a transcription of this particular census. So a transcription is where we type it up because handwriting can be really difficult to read. And I'm just going to give you just a few seconds to have a little look through this by yourself. Again, like I said, we're going to be blowing it up big in a moment. So if you can't see at the moment, just, just hang on. OK, so hopefully you've had a little look at that. So we're now going to make it a little bit bigger. And again, I'm just going to give you a few seconds to have a look at it. So what we have here is we have a snapshot into a single day at Buckingham Palace. So Sunday, the 6th of June, 1841. And we now want to use it to see what we can learn about Queen Victoria from this particular census. So first of all, you can tell that Queen Victoria is wealthy and important just by looking at how many people are living or visiting and especially working for her in Buckingham Palace. Now, you might be thinking, I don't need to look at a uh, census return in order to figure out that Queen Victoria was wealthy and important. Of course she is. She's the queen. She's living in a palace. A palace is not two bedrooms. It's something really large. But what we learn now, as we look at this census, we're going to actually be applying a little bit later on when we look at a census for somebody whose name we won't recognise living in a house, we won't know. And we can use the same clues in order to figure out, be a bit of a detective and figure out um, more about other people later on. You'll notice that Queen Victoria, her daughter and the Earl of Aboyne are both list are all listed by their titles. Now, this could be because it was a sign of respect, um, but it might also be that when they were filling this in in 1841, the person filling it in thought everybody knows who the Queen is. Everybody knows who the Earl of Aboyne is. Everybody knows what the first child Victoria was called. So we don't need to write it down. And sometimes that can be a little bit of a pain when we're looking at the census, when people assume we know the information already. And there we go. You can just see that bit blown up even bigger. And you can see their ages just on the right hand side. The Princess Royal is probably the one most difficult to read, but it says six months. OK. Um, they also abbreviated words on the census. Now, today we probably think with mobile phones that we invented abbreviations. We're always shortening things, aren't we, to message each other and talk to each other. But actually, this is something that's been going on for a long time. And when they were filling out census returns, they wanted to cut as many corners as possible. So they tried to shorten them. And there you can say, see that they have abbreviated His Royal Highness to HRH to make it shorter. And you can also see that George Thomas Keppel, they've shortened Thomas to just the first few letters and then the little s at the top um, so that it made it shorter and it fits in much better. And then the other thing we want to just mention is the fact that if we look at this form, you can see down the right hand side, they've been asked to list where they are from. And you'll notice that there are lots of little Fs if you look where the blue arrows are, they're picking them up. And there's one just brought up a little bit bigger. And the F stood for foreign parts, which is very unspecific. It could be anywhere in the world that isn't the United Kingdom. Um, but actually, we know because Prince Albert, because he was German, we know that uh, we know that probably all of the staff that came over with him would probably be German as well. So when we look down those names, most of them, in fact, are from Germany. And this Charles Bender that we've brought up nice and big here, I also wanted to mention that he has this very strange uh, job. He's called a Jaeger, Jaeger to um, His Royal Highness Prince Albert. And what a Jaeger is, it is in fact a hunter. And the royal family has always done lots of hunting. 
Um, but certainly back in the 1800s, that would have been a really important job. And if we look on the census, there are not just one hunter, but in fact, two hunters listed, both of them being staffed to Prince Albert. OK, thank you for listening to the first half of our presentation. What we're now going to do is take a couple of minutes break just to give you a chance to grab uh, a drink if you want one to pop to the toilet. Um, if you want to, you can start on any of the activities um, in the Passport to the Past. And I've just put up a picture of two of the ones that actually relate to today's session. So you will find amongst the activities, you can either fill in your own census for today's date. So listing everyone in your house who's either living or visiting the house on that day. Or if you're feeling really creative, you could draw a picture of your house and you could draw all the people within it. And if you wanted to add a little bit more detail, you could even label them so we know who all those people are. OK, we'll give you a couple of minutes and then we'll come back together. Thank you. Hello there, so welcome back. I hope you managed to have just a short uh, break. Um, so welcome back to the second half of the presentation. And now we've learned a little bit about what a census looks like and the sort of things that we can actually look out for. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be finding out about the life of an ordinary woman. So this is just um, a real person who really existed. And we're going to be looking through the censuses that we find her on in order to find out about her life. And this lady's name is Mary. OK, now, as before, I'm going to be showing you on the side the full census form to begin with. And then we'll go on to another side and just pull up some of the bits of information. So, again, if you're not seeing it too clearly, first of all, don't worry. OK, so this is Mary's first census. So this is 1871. And I'll just give you a few seconds to have a little look. OK, so what we've done here now is we've actually taken out the section that we really want to see. Um, so that is um, made much bigger at the bottom. Um, so if we're looking down it, we can see the yellow line that highlights Mary. Now, this is very important because if you haven't already noticed, Mary's mother is also called Mary and we don't want to confuse the two. So what you will find is on each side where we do this, we'll underline Mary herself, the one we really want to look at. 
So if we look at this right now, what we can see is we can see the address on the left hand side, Chadstone Lodge. We can then see Mary Robinson's, that is her surname. And then we can see three letters of the word daughter, D-A-U, which tells of a relationship um, to the head of the house, James White Robinson. And finally, you can see her age as well. So she is three years old. So I hope everybody can see that. So on the first census, I said she's just three. Her parents are James White Robinson and Mary Elizabeth Robinson. And on the right, you might be able to see that her father is a farmer who employs four men and three boys. And remember what we were saying about if we're trying to think about how wealthy somebody is, we might look at, for example, how many people um, they have working for them. And here we can see they've got seven people working for them. So it must be quite a large farm and they might they must be quite wealthy. And we can see that Mary has two younger sisters, Margaret and Edith Maria. And we can see they're living in Northamptonshire. And finally, they have two servants and again, an indication that they're probably doing pretty well for themselves. Okay, so let's jump ahead another 10 years. So here we see the 1881 census for Mary. Just give you a few seconds to find her on there. And on this form, it's a bit more difficult to read because you can see the enumerator, the man collecting the information or woman um, has gone round and he hasn't just collected information for one household, but several. So we just want to find the bit about Mary and there we have it. OK, and if we look again at the yellow line and we can see something quite unusual, we can see Mary's name and next to that we can see what looks like a D and an O. And what that means is ditto and it means the same as above. So the person filling this out has said, I don't want to write out Robinson, the surname, every single time I mention one of the members of the family. So they write out ditto, D-O, and that just tells us it's the same as above. And then next to that, again, we can see those first three letters of the name daughter. And then next to that, slightly unclearer, the first three letters of unmarried. OK, in other census returns, sometimes we have an S for single. And finally, we can see that she's 13 years old. So 13 now and unmarried. And she's still living with her parents, but they've moved to a different farm, but still in the same county and her father is still listed as a farmer and Mary and her siblings are listed as scholars so that's put down as the job and this means that they went to school or were privately tutored and finally we can see that they have a governor slash teacher and also a servant and the fact that they do have a governess probably tells you that Mary and her siblings are being educated at home not at school so again, we're going to just jump ahead another 10 years. So it is now 1891. And again, we're going to pull out the bit that we want to look at. And I'll just give you a few seconds to have a go at reading this one yourself. So if you managed to get that she was 23 years old, well done to you, very good. Um, she's still living in the same farm with her parents. And she's now living with four siblings um, as listed, Edith Maria, James, Ethel Sargent, unusual name, and Louisa Mary. And she's not listed as employed. Now this could be two reasons. Either her family are wealthy enough that she doesn't need to get a job, or because it's a farm and it's a family farm, maybe she's actually working for the family business and because of that they just haven't bothered to list her uh, as as working on the farm and it looks at first glance like very little has changed since the last census but we have to remember that a census is really only half of any story so just because very little seems to have changed doesn't mean that it hasn't it might be that in that time she's learnt new things she might have fallen in love she might have made new friends and gone new places so a census is great for telling us some things but not everything now you might have noticed that she's got less 
brothers and sisters mentioned in this one. In fact, two of her sisters from the last census, Margaret and Catherine, are not listed. And I'm just going to give you a few seconds to have a think or a chat with the people who are there just about where those two sisters might have gone. So well done for having a think about that. There are some different ideas to where they could be. First of all, they could have just been missed off this accidentally or deliberately. It could be that they were visiting friends or other family. They're both quite young women, so there's a very good possibility that they've both got married by this point and moved out of the family home. They could be somewhere like in hospital or even, and we hope not, but they could have died. And being young women, we wouldn't expect that. But this was done. This census was filled in well over 100 years ago. And back then, you know, people did die slightly younger. So that is a possibility, even though we hope it's not the case. Unfortunately, with these two sisters, we were not able to find out where they are. So sometimes there are just questions that we look into, but unfortunately, no matter how good a detective we are, we can't find them. Later on, though, you're going to see that that's not always the case. Sometimes we can find out about where people have disappeared to. OK, so we're now jumping ahead another 10 years. It is now 1901. And there's the little bit that we want to look at. And again, I'll just give you a few seconds to have a look. OK, so it's all changed for Mary. So if we look down this, you will see that she is now 34 years old and a huge amount has changed for her. She's now married to John Riddy, who's here mentioned as being age 37, and he is a bank manager. Again, probably a good indication that they're doing quite well for themselves. She has moved to London and she now has a family of her own. So she has three children. She has Edith Mary, she has John and she has Cicely. Quite an unusual name, quite a lovely name. And we'll come back to Cicely a bit later on again. And they also have two servants. OK, and at this point, we're just going to pop the censuses to one side and we're going to see what other things we can find. And we're very lucky with Mary because we were able to find her marriage certificate. So when you got married in a church in the past, they would write it down inside a nice big book and we're able to have a look at that page there. And there it is a little bit bigger. OK, and if we look down it, we can see Mary again underlined in yellow and we can see that here she marries John Augustus Riddy. And at the time he was a bank clerk, not a bank manager. So, in fact, the census we just looked at in 1901, this marriage actually took place nine years before that. So quite a lot of even change between the two censuses. They married in 1892. And as I said, quite a lot has changed for her. And what's really lovely about this marriage certificate is that we can see she's actually signed her name. And an interesting thing to mention on this particular uh, uh, census is that you will notice that John is listed as being a bachelor, which is a single man. And Mary is listed as being a spinster, which at the time meant that she was a single woman, an unmarried woman. But today, if we used a word like that, it wouldn't be a very nice word. You know, it would be not a nice thing to call somebody. And it just goes to show you how language has changed a bit that, you know, back then it just meant one thing. Today, it means something else. OK, and we're now jumping ahead another 10 years and we have the 1911 census. And we have the bit we want blown up again, although the writing is, I'm afraid, a little bit small here. And so if we look on the 1911 census, we can see that Mary's husband, John, is listed along with two servants. And this is probably John's nice, neat handwriting. Um, an interesting point, if you look at the right hand column, which I've highlighted in yellow, um, 
just to pull out a really interesting point that since 1871 so since the censuses that we've been looking at for mary we have had this end column which asked to have listed disabilities and the writing here is really small so i've written it out i'm also going to read it to you what it says is if any person included in the schedule is one totally deaf or deaf and dumb two totally blind three lunatic four imbecile or feeble-minded and the reason i wanted to mention that is because again about the language we would not use this kind of language today this is the kind of language that we would consider to be very insulting but a hundred years ago it was just used as a term in talking about people with disabilities so again just an interesting way things have changed and John is now living in, on the high street in Morton in Marsh. And if you don't know Morton, it is this beautiful Gloucestershire village, really lovely out in the Cotswolds. But someone's missing, aren't they? Mary is not listed. So again, I'm just going to give you 30 seconds or so, just to have a think or a chat about why Mary is not on the census. Where is she? Okay, welcome back. Um, so there are many possibilities once again, aren't there? So Mary could be in hospital or she could have died. Um, it could be that John and Mary have split up, they've separated and perhaps she's living somewhere else. It could be that she's visiting someone. So there are lots of different options. Very luckily for us this time round, we were able to spot where Mary had gone. And here is the census that we find her on. And there's the bit that we want to look at. And we found Mary on a different census in a different household. That on the night of the census, which was Sunday the 2nd, April 1911, Mary and at this point her 12 year old daughter Cicely were visitors to a house in Lincolnshire. And you can see that I've underlined them in yellow. And I, this time I've underlined both of them because sometimes when we're looking at things in the past and we're trying to find people, it can be made very difficult by the fact that people often have the same names. So quite often we think we found somebody, our great grandmother or whoever it is we're looking for. And actually it turns out it was someone with the same name living at the same time in the same area. And it can get very confusing. Um, the way we find out that this is definitely Mary is partly due to her daughter, Cicely. Now, Cicely is quite an unusual name and mentioned alongside Mary, seeing that the dates tally up, Mary is listed as having three children, which we know she did, um, means that we can be pretty sure that this in fact is Mary. And they were visiting Elizabeth Dunkley and her daughter Catherine, but we have no idea whether they were friends or family. And sometimes, especially, it is much harder to find out about friends than it is family. And it's sometimes hard to find people on the census. Sometimes they were missed off deliberately or by accident, or perhaps the information was wrong. And the artist JMW Turner, very famous British artist who you see a portrait of here, um, on the night of the census, he decided he didn't want to go on the census. Maybe he didn't want to be taxed. Maybe he just didn't want to appear on any paperwork. You know, today we know people who don't like to be online. They don't like to use Facebook or Twitter because they just don't want their information out there. And perhaps Turner felt exactly the same. But whatever his reasons were, he had a very extreme reaction to this. He rowed a boat into the middle of the Thames River in London in order to make sure that no Nobody could get him on the census. And sometimes names are wrong. They used a nickname or their middle name. I had massive difficulties trying to find my own grandmother because I thought her name was Mary Phillips. And it turned out that was her middle name. Her first name was Ada, but she didn't like to use it. And because of that, it took me ages to actually find her on the census. And I had to go back to family and find out why that was. And sometimes paperwork is lost. Really sadly for us, the whole of the 1931 census was lost during World War II. So there was a big fire and unfortunately the whole lot went up on, in smoke, which is really sad for us trying to look into the past. Now, normally, 
we would stop at this point. So we've just looked at 1911. At this point, normally we would have to say we can't go any further. And that is due to data protection. So today we have our personal information protected, which means that anybody thought to be alive, you wouldn't want to put their information up online for anybody to read it. And it's felt that 100 years is about the right amount of time to stop that happening. So later on in the next 12 months, in fact, the next census, the 1921 census will come out. But at the moment, we can only go up to 1911. However, we had two very good pieces of good luck. Um, the first was something called the 1939 register, this one-off census. And the second bit of luck was in fact, this album here. And we have 12 million records at the archives, but luckily for us, we had this album, which is filled with information relating to Mary. So we're going to come back to this in a moment. So Mary on the 1939 register. So there is a picture of what this census looks like and it's really too small to read, but I just wanted to draw one important point, which is you will notice that there are black lines across the screen. If you look at the page, you can see these black lines and what it reads is this record is officially closed. So anybody who is thought to be still alive, who appeared on the 1939 register has been blacked out. And then later on, for example, if they've passed away, what they do is then they take those black lines away and we're able to read it. I'm not sure why we we're allowed to look at the 1939 census, but we are and that's great. So here is Mary's and I'll give you a few seconds to read it. Okay, so what can we read? Well, first of all, it has been almost 30 years since the last census we looked at in 1911. So Mary is now 72 years old. She's still living in a house called The Steps in Morton in the Marsh in Gloucestershire. And she's still living with her daughter, Cicely, although Cicely is now married to a Reginald G. Bennett, and he is a vicar. And quite curiously, there is this name, Eleanor S. Philo or Philo, maybe a retired school principal is also listed there. We have no idea whether they were living there, whether they were just visiting. She is about the same age as Mary. So maybe she's a friend, or maybe she's somebody else. And if you look to the far right hand side, if you follow Cicely's name along, you will notice that she is mentioned as being in the women's voluntary service. Now, if you think it was only men who were involved in World War II, you're absolutely wrong. Women had a very important role to play as well. And the vol women's voluntary service was an important thing during World War II. Um, what they did was they looked out for fires from bombs, um, they cared for the injured, they took refreshments to air raids, and they also distributed food, clothing, blankets, and ration books. And that takes us on to this wonderful album. And we're just going to have a quick look at this. So this is an album that was put together and it was put together by a member of Mary's family. And if we just have a little look and don't worry if you can't see too close in at the moment, because I'm going to put some of these images on screen in a second. And what we can see is we can see postcards of Morton. We can see the insides of churches and cafes. We can see pictures of the Riddy family. So Mary's married name Riddy, we can see pictures of her family and where she lived. And we even have a few bits and pieces. So for example, we have this newspaper article, which again, we're going to look at in a moment. And we even have a couple of interesting curiosities. We have a couple of school textbooks, which go back one to 1915. And one, in fact, actually this one goes back to about 1840. So I'm going to just close that one there. And here we can now show you some of the images from this album. And for the first time, after all that information about Mary, we get to see what she looks like. So there she is on the left with her husband, John. And I especially like this photograph because they look really happy together, don't they? Um, we can also see John Ruddy standing outside 
his house, the steps in Morton. And we can now see as well why the house is called the steps, um, because it has this wonderful uh, glamorous facade outside. And this is just a really good um, uh, to show you that sometimes things like photographs can tell you things that say census, uh, censuses or marriage uh, certificates, for example, really can't. So photography can be really important when we're learning about people in the past. And you can also see a couple of pictures of the back of the steps as well. And again, I decided to show you this because you can see they have a tennis court. And again, that really tells you that, you know, they're living in a lovely house. It really is fantastic. And we'll just move on. And now we can see the pictures of Mary and John, but we can also see them with their children. So on the left hand side, we can see John and Mary with their daughter, Cicely, that who we've mentioned lots of times. And we can see a picture of her as well below in front of a plane. And at the top, we can see probably an earlier photograph than the others here. We can see Edith Mary, so that was their eldest daughter. And we can see this picture from World War I, so the Great War. So we're looking at 1914 to 1918. And again, very important, women played an important role in that war too, often as nurses. And we can see a picture of her marriage to um, George Deacon. And I love this picture because she's wearing the most fantastic dress, which is very much of its time. And finally, we can see Mary and John with their uh, Mary and John with their son, who was also called John. And we notice the fact that he's dressed in an army uniform. And we might at this point think, is this picture taken in World War Two? So after 1939. And actually, if I didn't have the information I'm going to show you in a moment, we would perhaps think, yes, that probably is taken during World War II, but um, in a moment I'll explain why it couldn't possibly have been that late. And finally, I want to show you a picture of Mary's grandchildren. This is Anthony and Joyce, and we especially want to pull out Joyce, uh, this lovely little girl with a little dog. Um, she's very important to us because she's the one who not only put together this great album, but she also wrote on the backs of all of the pictures who everybody was. And if she hadn't have done that, I would not have been able to identify any of the family, not even Mary. So we love Joyce, she's great. Okay. And we even have Mary's uh, ID card. So that was during World War II and also the ration book that she had from World War II. Um, but we still don't know where John is on the register. Why wasn't he listed in um, the household? Well, we turn here to a newspaper clipping to give us the answer. And this newspaper clipping is from Sicily's marriage. And if you look at the top, it was taken in January 1939. And I'm just going to draw out the bit we want to look at. And we see Miss Cicely Margaret Riddy, younger daughter of the late Mr. J. A. Riddy. Now, when we see the word late, it means that that person has passed away. And not only have they passed away, but they've passed away quite recently. And in fact, other research that I did um, alongside this um, showed that unfortunately John died the year before in 1938. So when we were looking at that picture of him with his son, and I was saying it couldn't have been World War II, um, that is because he unfortunately died about a year before that happened. And I just want to draw another little thing, which was this great photograph of the marriage of Sicily and the woman to the right. Um, that is Joyce again. So that is the niece. Uh, I'm sorry, the granddaughter who put together this album. Thank you very much for listening. Um, we're now going to stop to see if anybody has got any questions. And we're just having a check. No, that's absolutely fine. Um, um, I, I have a question. Um, why, why can't we view any of the? Um, or I've gone with it's called now, now past a hundred, with John a hundred years old. It's because of data protection. So in the last few years, especially, um, there's been. Um, a lot of laws passed in our country um, to say that um, certain personal information shouldn't be available to everybody. Um, and that might be just because, you know, you don't want people to um, have access to your name and your birth date and all those kind of information. Um, so 
what they did was they put in this sort of hundred years. They said nothing older, um, nothing sooner, sorry, than a hundred years that we can look at. Um, and that way it protects people. Um, it protects their information. It's a really good question. And, and to be honest with you, I don't really understand why it is that we're not allowed to look after 1911, um, but we are allowed to look at the 1939 census, which is obviously, you know, it, that, that is sooner than a hundred years. But for some reason, somebody made a decision that we could see that one yeah great question any others um how did joyce get the photo album into the archives um good question so um presumably joyce had been collecting up this kind of information for some time the way we all do at home don't we we all have lots of stacks of photographs and things like that um and at some point she put to what together the album because she felt that the lives of her families was important and it was something that should be made available to the public so they thought that it might be something worth looking at and we obviously agree because we've just spent sort of a long time sort of talking about it um, so what then she did was she would have booked to come and see one of our what we call an archivist that's somebody who looks after the records here and they were able to then put them into um, our archives and we have these massive rooms I mean huge like the size of tennis courts that are packed packed and packed and packed with these kinds of records and actually you can come and view these things for yourself you know this album is available for people to come and see so at the moment we are closed probably till mid-April um, but once we reopen, um, you'll be able to book in and you can come and see this album or you could even look on our catalogue. That's a list of everything we have. And you could um, and you could uh, um, you could come and see other items for yourself. I mean, we have so much here. It's 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 amazing. Um, if you want to have a look at that, what you can do is go onto our web website and just try typing in. You could type in your own surname and just see, um, you know, what records we have relating to to your family. Great question. Okay. Um, are the censuses in other countries? Thank you. That's coming from Helen, I think. Um, yeah, that, that's a great question. Yes, there's, there's a whole variety. Every country does things very differently. Um, so, for example, the United Kingdom, we were quite late coming to putting together censuses. In lots of other countries, they have ones that are much older and they all have their own separate laws about what you can see and what you can't. But yes, probably every country has some form of census. And in fact, the oldest ones we have are about, oh, I think they're about 4,000 years old and they're written on clay tablets. Um, and it tells you how many sheep everybody has or, you know, how how much uh, how many fields they have it's amazing um what still exists um so we've had another question from jacob are there other things in the archives oh gosh i where do i start um we have photographs and diaries and artwork we basically have anything that exists on paper we have old big dusty books but we also have things that people have brought in a month ago or two months ago um you know it could be anything and even children for example um some of the things that you've been creating during the pandemic for example posters for the nhs things like that we are also accepting that kind of item that can go into our archives and it means that in the future when people are trying to learn about the lockdown and what we're going through at the moment and believe me they will because these are really um you know really unusual times people will want to know about them they would be able to go into the archives in a hundred years and they would be able to see a poster that somebody made are there fabrics there aren't fabrics actually not really um, we tend to collect only things that appear on paper um, so things like fabrics you would get more in museums um, but yes anything on paper here so um, like I said diaries books um, you get lots of legal documents and things like that P people's poetry you get music that's written down and we also um, increasingly as well collect digital items the so things that you create on your computer any other questions? Oh, 
Oh, how old is Joyce now? Well, that is a good question. Um, I can't tell you what has happened to Joyce. We don't have any information on her personally. Um, so um, I, I'm afraid that isn't an answer that I, I, I can't answer that. And part of the reason I can't answer that is because obviously she was born a lot later. And so we probably, you know, we can't see the censuses um, for during her lifetime. But it's a really good question and it does beg to, to ask, you know, how do we find out about people who perhaps have been born in the last hundred years? And perhaps the best way we do that is by asking our family about people in our family, getting stories from them. Uh, did Turner get fined for not doing the census? I don't think he did, no. I don't think at that time they, they had fines. Um, but today, uh, funny enough, I just happened to read yesterday um, that if you don't fill in the one in three weeks, um, you can be fined up to a thousand pounds for not doing it. So filling in the census, it's not just something we are, you know, the country asks, the government asks people to do. They say, it's a law, you've got to do it. What's the oldest document we have in our archive? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think we have a document that goes back about uh, 900 years, approximately. My colleague Jenny, who you can't see, is sort of nodding in the background. Um, yes, about 900 years old. Um, so really, really old. Yes. Some of them have amazing wax seals as well on them, which are incredible. And for those of you who are learning about um, the Tudors at school, we also have items from Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. Um, we have some really incredible stuff here. Thank you. Right, um, any other last questions? No, I think we're gonna end it there. So I just want to say one or two additional things. Oh, sorry, just one other question has just come in, which I will answer because it's a very important one, which is, uh, do you have to book to come to the archive or can you come in whenever you want? Um, at the moment, um, you absolutely do. Well, at the moment, we're closed, so you can't come in at the moment anyway. Um, but we will be opening in approximately uh, approximately mid-April and we will be taking um, pre-booking so in other words people will need to contact the archives and actually arrange to come in um, we can also help you if there are particular things that you want to look at we can also organize that so that we have those documents ready for you and we'll organize a time for you to come in and see them um, but yes generally we do ask people anyway even when we haven't got a pandemic to book in and that means that really we can get all the things you want to see okay thank you brilliant thank you for all those questions fantastic um, so finally I just wanted to mention what you can do next if you've been inspired by today's session uh, first of all you can find census uh, censuses for yourself on places like Ancestry, which is online. Now at the moment, Ancestry is something that you have to pay a subscription for, but if you go onto our Gloucestershire Archives website and you look under family resources, you will find a link there to Ancestry. You can follow that and you can look at the records for Gloucestershire for free. Now, if you want to look at ones outside Gloucestershire, maybe your family come from somewhere else. Um, if you still don't want to pay, which I wouldn't blame you, um, what you can actually do is we have a family history centre here. And again, once we reopen, we have computers that you can use for free. And we have people here who will help you as well with your research. Again, you do have to book that uh, when we reopen. Um, but that is one thing you can do. Um, you can do some activities from the passport from the past, wax seals, time capsules, all kinds of exciting things. Um, you could take pictures of your own family and don't forget to label them. Um, finally, I think the best way if you want to know about people in the past, particularly your family, is just to ask your family, you know, sit down and ask them about the best stories they have about, you know, their parents, and their parents' parents. Um, that is really the best way. And finally, um, just before we all head off, I just want to tell you about next month's event because it is going to be a great one. So we are going to be doing the Victorian schoolroom experience. So myself and Miss O'Keefe are going to be dressing up as school teachers, Victorian school teachers, and we are going to be holding our class on Wednesday the 7th of April at 4pm. It's always the first Wednesday of every month. We'll be finding out about uh, 
um, what happened to children before the Education Act made it a legal requirement to go to school. We'll be finding out about some of the reasons children gave for being absent from school. We'll be looking at some of the punishments and rewards that were given out. And we'll be finding out about how children learn to sit up straight and why children should be seen and not heard. Uh, we will be learning how to write like a Victorian with a quill pen and ink that you can make yourself from a few simple ingredients. And those instructions for the quill pen and the ink, when you sign up for our next event, you will have in the invitation that comes out to you, there will be instructions on how you can do that ahead of time. Finally, if you can dress up um, for our next event, please do so. Um, so the school uniform in the Victorian times. So girls, if you could wear a dark dress or skirt with a white apron tied at the back, thick black socks or tights and black shoes or boots. And boys, a sh shirt, dark colored trousers or shorts and boots with long socks and black shoes or boots, a plain brown or grey jacket or jumper, a cloth cap for wearing outside. So please do join us. We would absolutely love to see you again. Thank you so much for joining today's session um, and we hope to see you again in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Farewell. <laughs>